everybody. Welcome to uh, our webinar. My name is Jana Renstrom. I'm the founder and president of the Coda Alliance. We work for gender equality and women's empowerment um, locally here in New York City, as well as globally, uh, collaborating with over 60 nonprofit organizations and women entrepreneurs who work for the same things. Um, tonight, we're bringing a program which I'm looking very much forward to. Uh, and which we hope will be useful both for uh, nonprofit organizations and women entrepreneurs um, about uh, influencer marketing, uh, something that I think is really important uh, with this overwhelming amount of information that we're all being subjected to all the time. How do we break through this uh, um, into this uh, field with our important messages? Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, Neil Feinstein and William Murphy, who uh, uh, Neil, Neil is an old friend of CODA who has uh, contributed before. So thank you for being here again. And thank you to both of you. Uh, and uh, Neil is a uh, marketer uh, and uh, Will is an attorney and they both are also professors at St. John's University. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to what you have to say. Um, and can you, uh, Go to our uh, the um, next slide really quickly. We are recording this uh, webinar. It will be available later on our website. If you don't want to show your face, you can of course turn your video off. Um, and uh, we should have some time at the end for uh, for questions and answers. Uh, you can start typing them into the chat box anytime you want. And uh, if you have any uh, technical issues, please email info at Coda Alliance. And uh, shall we go now to uh, Will? You had the presentation, your slides. Mm -hmm. I want to go ahead and uh, put that up. And there you go. You see in my screen? Yep. Looks All right. Nice. Hey, how are you, Let everybody? You nice. To, I'm here with my uh, colleague, Will. Uh, we're, we're good buddies, even though he's a lawyer. <laughs> in, in the world of marketing, the, the, biz, the job of the marketer is to get the company business, and the job of the attorney is to keep the company in business. And so we do work together in very many ways. What we're going to talk to you about today is influencer marketing, um, which is really, I mean, it's, it's just huge. I've got some numbers coming at you that are going to show you exactly how big the market is and how it's growing tremendously. So we start by, it's not going. Hold on, there we go. How many of you know any of these people on this page? Anybody recognize anybody there? The fellow in the upper left-hand corner is James Charles. The, the fellow in the center on the top is Casey Neistat. Casey Neistat has 3.2 million Instagram followers and YouTube followers. James Charles, the one on the on the left, excuse me, not on the right, on the left, um, has 20, I'm looking at my numbers. I looked at it, I just looked it up today. 23 million followers on Instagram and YouTube. Um, what you won't see, yes, you, while you do, we'll see Selena Gomez in there. Um, what you won't see in this uh, group of people is a Kardashian, any of the Kardashians, or because, but Kim alone has over 110 million followers on Instagram. So clearly influence marketing is, is big. Um, but before I tell you how big, I have one more question for you. Uh, how many of you have heard of Fire Festival? Did anybody here go? Did anybody here at least buy tickets to go? Um, influencer marketing can go extremely bad. And this the poster child for this is Fire Festival. Um, there are two documentaries on it. Many of you may have seen it. One is on Hulu, one is on Netflix. Um, uh, there were, based on what happened with uh, Fire Festival, and we're gonna take you through that. We're actually gonna build a, a, an exercise around it later on in this uh, presentation, but there were significant legal consequences. However, the legal consequences for, were for the um, people who organized the event. But what about all of those models 
um, Kendall Jenner and Bella Habib, who were in the uh, promotions, uh, who promoted the event, do they have any legal consequences in this, in this issue? Um, and they were paid handsomely for it. As influencer marketing grows bigger and becomes more potent, advertisers, agencies, and brands uh, ha need to build relationships with customers based on transparency and authenticity. Transparency and authenticity are driving tenets in brands in 2020. So let's start from the beginning by defining what exactly influencer marketing is. Uh, according to G. Swan, influencer marketing means hiring key content creators to drive authentic conversation and engagement around a brand's product or message. So we've been doing that in the world of advertising for a long time. We've been creating models. We've been creating brand icons for a long time. So let's look at, let's start by looking at a history that led up to influencer marketing. Some people claim that Aunt Jemima was the first influencer when she was introduced as an advertising icon back in 1889. Um, clearly, Aunt Jemima now is going through some issues <laughs> in the world. I believe they've actually done away with Aunt Jemima. But um, back in 1889, when Aunt Jemima was introduced, there was no social media let alone the internet, and there was no way for consumers to interact with the brand. The messaging was just pushing out to the consumer. The consumer wasn't coming back in. So brands have always created icons. I mean, think about Tony the Tiger, and brands have always hired spokespeople for years to endorse their products. But this was always, again, a one-way conversation where we were pushing messages out. Um, Influencer marketing, what makes something influencer marketing primary is, is that it primarily occurs on social media, such as blogs, and, and it, it enables consumers to interact with the, with, the, uh, with the influencer, to actually have a conversation. And really within that is where the power lies for influencer marketing. So you could say that the first influencer marketing began back in, what was the day, 2001, when Heather Armstrong on, launched Do, Do Say, Do Say, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, which was the model for mommy bloggers. And it, be, it was about the trials and tribulations of being a mom and mommy blogging was an outlet for writer, writers to eulogize about their lives in a way that was raw and authentic. There's that word authentic again. Back in 2006, Paper Post came about, and that was the first online marketplace where bloggers and brands could come together and brands could pay bloggers to create content about around their product. Um, and then I think that influencer marketing really kind of hit its stride back in 2010 with the Old Spice campaign when Wyden Kennedy um, rebranded Old Spice and made it the um, fragrance that every man wants and that every man and that every woman wants their man to wear. But what was so interesting was as part of that launch campaign that Isaiah Mustafa do a, a, um, a, a day on YouTube where he was interacting with the audience. And all of a sudden people realized that that influencers who are engaging with their customers had extreme power, more power than a spokesperson. So now we, now we look at this from a historical perspective. One of my favorite authors is this man called Philip Kotler. Kotler if anybody's in marketing, he has written the, the book on marketing. And he talks a lot about the different areas of marketing. In marketing 1.0 was the product phase. That was the Mad Men days when, um, you know, when um, products were on TV and you could talk about products and their benefits to the consumer. And then marketing 2.0 happened. And that's when databases came around back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. So now we could start to capture data about our customer and interact with that customer using that data to approximate a conversation. But then social media, then the internet happened and social media happened 
and we entered marketing 3.0, which is the age of collaboration, because now consumers were using social media to find out about brands, not counting on advertising. So the power of advertising actually started to wane and social media became a primary um, source of brand identification, brand relationships. And so consumers um, were now looking to social media and the only way that brands could engage them was by collaborating with them. If I could get somebody to talk about my brand on social media, it was way more powerful than me putting an ad out there telling everybody how great my brand is. Well, now we are in marketing 4.0, which is the age of connectivity. And if you think about it, we are um, everywhere we go, we are connected to the internet. Uh, you go, you go walk down the street, you go, you go to a park, there is connectivity there. And it's not just being connected to the internet, it's what the, the internet connection, the connections that the internet connectivity enables and allows you to connect with people, brands, influencers all over the place. One of the things, one of the big characteristics of this of this um, age of con connectivity is the fact that consumers are mobile. And I'm not talking about the device, the phone. And while the phone is the very um, enabler of this, the fact is that consumers are moving around pre-COVID a lot. <laughs> and so that doesn't mean that they are not connected, they're connected wherever they are. So connectivity was very important and all of this infrastructure, all of this um, consumer behavior enabled brands like Instagram and YouTube to take over as the premier um, source for influencer marketing because people are connecting to videos wherever they are. If they're sitting in a bus station, they're watching a video waiting for their bus. If they're sitting on that bus, they're scrolling through their Instagram. And so behavior, this behavior of connect, that connectivity allowed enabled the media that is the most powerful for influencers. If I was in my classroom, I would say, does anybody have any questions at this point? <laughs> so the reasons why influencers have become very more powerful is again, credibility and trust. Imagine that influencer marketing is happening on social media. Now, I don't let anybody into my social media. I let people I trust and I care about into my social media, even if it's somebody I don't know. So influencers are perceived as friends. In some cases, they're perceived as more reliable and more credible than, their, um, than actual friends of theirs because they have a certain expertise. Again, think back to James Charles at the very beginning, he's in my social media, he's talking about makeup and cosmetics and beauty. Well, he's got an expertise about it, yet he's in my social media, so he's a friend also. The other thing is that consumers are no longer paying attention to advertising. Advertising is just waning in its, in its authority in the world. Influencer marketing is becoming more powerful. But here's an interesting oxymoron. Influencer marketing is actually by the classic definition of advertising, it's advertising. We are paying somebody to promote our brand. Interesting, it is still paid media, but what it does is it creates extremely high engagement levels. I don't engage with a Super Bowl ad, I do engage with an influence marketer. And, and when I get a message back from an influence marketer and that's what they do, that's how they build up their following, it makes me feel special. So all of this just leads us to talk about how fast influencer marketing is growing and it's growing tremendously. In 2019, it was a $6.5 billion, $6 billion marketplace. And what they found in two, between 2018 and 2019, the year over year growth was 65%. 15, and, and in terms of search, P, 
people were increased, it increased search activity. So one of the most powerful ways that we in advertising determine if a medium is, is working for us is really, re is classically return on investment. What we found with influencer marketing that for every dollar you spend, you are making $5.20. And that kind of ROI is pretty astounding. So when we choose, when in the, in the advertising business, when we decide to choose how we're going to, what media we're gonna work for, we choose based on two criteria, the reach of the media, how many people it reaches and who the media, who it reaches. Now I would argue typically influencers are defined in terms of reach. And this is a classic way of looking at them. We have everything from mega influencers, which have over 1 million followers. So all those people that were on that second slide that I showed you all the way down to nano influencers. And those people have maybe a thousand followers, but those thousand followers are very passionate. And they may be really good people that you want to meet. They may be the cream of the crop. And that's fine to choose an influencer based on the number of people they reach. And that's how advertising um, media uh, fees are set based on how many people you're reaching. But I would argue there's a much better way to choose how you're going to in influence, how you're going to pick your influencer. You need an influencer that does what you need the influencer to do, not that has a lot of people. So let me be, let me be clear about that. We have defined six different types of influencers. First are referent influencers. So typically we think of influencers as people like James Charles or Casey Neistat or Selena Gomez or a Kardashian. But really, the most important influencers for you or for me are people that are already in my social media um, uh, graph, in my social graph, my friends. If my friends say a restaurant is good, I'm more likely to go to that restaurant than if an ad says it's good. So that's somebody I already know and that's somebody I already trust. That said, when I'm looking to buy a new hybrid car or when I'm looking to buy that, you know, the best T flat screen TV that I can buy, I do still turn to the expert. And there are many expert influencers out there. And that's an important part of the purchase funnel. There are also people that are positional influencers. And those are the people that are with you at the moment of purchase. The best example of this, so that's, you know, you take your friend to Best Buy with you because he knows a lot about TVs and he helps you pick out the best TV to buy. I like to say the best example of this are the ladies who are sitting on the back of the couch behind the brides on say yes to the dress, telling her which dress she should buy and which dress she should not buy. Those are, those are powerful influencers because they are with you at the point of purchase. There are exposure influences. All those people that were on the front slide our exposure influences, the celebrity influences. It's, it's Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio getting online talking about voting rights or talking about climate change. And yeah, we listen to them. We don't perceive them as experts, but they still have authority and we do trust them because of who they are. But there are also situational influencers. Those are people that are there at the moment an event is happening. And they're influencing not through, um, not the way a positional influencer is saying, is helping you make a purchase decision. They're influencing you based on your opinion about something. So I like to say the best example of this, if you remember back to the shooting at the Parkland School in Florida, those kids that were on the news reports, those were situational influencers. And they were getting, and then they turned into real activists and they became advocacy influencers. These are people who have a cause, who are influencing not because we're paying them, but because they care deeply about something. And I'm actually gonna take you through a case study that explores a lot of these different influencer topographies and how one person, because it's not cut and dry, how one person stays can start in one area 
and then move along to different areas. So this is the case study. I don't know if any of you know this, that's Susan Fowler. Susan Fowler was the developer who worked at Uber for one year. And from the moment she started her job at Uber, she was hit by sexual harassment. Her boss started making passes at her right away. And so let's just take a quick little timeline. So she started work, she got a job back and she back in the time when it was really good to be a developer, a web developer at Uber and, and at, at, all of, at all of Silicon Valley. And um, she started her job and her boss started hitting on her through email. So there was a record of it. So she went to HR and she said, you know, this is happening. You know, we have to stop it. And you would imagine in this day and age, HR would say, oh my God, this is terrible. We'll take care of it right away. They said, no, it's his first, he's a high performer. It's his first, it's his first um, offense and we will, um, we'll talk to him and we'll take care of it that way. So they did that, but it kept going on and on and on. And so then they started blaming her and they said, well, you know, you can change, you can, you can transfer out of that department or you can stay there, but just know if you stay there, you're gonna to start to get terrible reviews. So this went on, she ultimately ended up transferring out of that department. She stayed there for about a year and then she left and she wrote a blog post called my very, is it up here? Um, reflecting on one very, very strange year at Uber. And she talked about her experience. And if you get a chance, you should all Google it because it's really fascinating. Well, this blog post started within her own reference. She was a referent influencer at that point because only the people who were following her within her blogs knew who she was and were reading it. But, but all of a sudden it caught fire and, it's, and, it, and it started snowballing. And it led to um, several se senior level people at Uber leaving, a lot of bad press, Travis Kalanick, the owner, the, the CEO of Uber, was forced to resign, and there were major changes going on at Uber. And if any of you remember back in 2017, the Time Magazine cover for Persons of the Year, Susan Fowler was one of those Persons of the Year. So then she was hired to be an editor at the New York Times, an opinion editor on technology. So now she's moved from being a referent influencer to being an advocacy influencer because she was advocating about women's rights and me too. And then she became an expert influencer as an editor for the New York Times as opinion editor. And then last, just this year in February, she had a book published called Whistleblower. So we're not hard and fast in any one of those topologies. You can move throughout them. But if you're looking to build an influencer program, you know, you may want to start with the people who are closest to your brand, who know your brand, who are already passionate about your brand and can spread the word about your brand very easily, even before you go out to those mega influencers and start paying them to do something for your brand. On that note, I'm going to pass the, uh, pass the uh, baton to my... <laughs> to my colleague, Will Murphy. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Thank you. So um, as Neil did a, uh, a really thorough and fantastic job explaining, uh, there's great prevalence to uh, influencer marketing these days, and there's great profit to influencer marketing these days. And when that equation sort of fits together and reaches a critical mass, it's no surprise that people start asking the question, what are the limits on influencer marketing? Marketing is it regulated in some way, and, and this is true of any maturing maturing industry. But I think what's interesting, what we're going to examine a little further, is the limitations on the legal limits of influencer marketing, and whether those limits are are even uh, beyond effective. Are, are they even appropriate? in some ways. We're sort of crossing an interesting line here with the way certain influencers take form. Of course, an advocacy influencer. We're going to do a case study in a few minutes about an anonymous influencer. Um, are we in some way by regulating that industry 
becoming impin impin impingement on, on an individual's free speech through social media. But I think a, a, a good place to start, of course, is where we started this whole presentation with, and that's Fire Festival. And I think the reason why Fire Festival becomes so ubiquitous in this conversation about influencer marketing is because it's the most glaring example of what happens when influencer marketing goes wrong. It was an incredibly successful influencer marketing campaign, but of course, at the end of the day, it was public in a, a mass quantity, thousands of consumers who were uh, tragically misled and uh, placed in a really bad circumstance down in the Bahamas out thousands and thousands of dollars. So what I want to do is kind of, um, I can't really see how many folks we have here, but I'm going to do a little discussion about Fire Festival, setting the scene for those of you who may not be intimately familiar with it. I'm going to show a promo up next that was used via social media through influencers to promote Fire Festival. Then I'm going to kind of break down what went wrong with it. And then I'm interested to hear people's thoughts about what could have been done from a marketing perspective to, uh, to, to make this situation not as, as catastrophic in the end as it ended up being. But I want us to take a certain approach. I want us to focus not on the fire Festival organizers, but on the influencers. So let's look, look at the video that was went viral uh, on social media across a number of platforms. Um, again, put out there by Emily Ratchikowski and Kyle Jenner and all these all these Instagram um, models with millions and millions and millions of followers. And this is what, what was put out there to the public advertising uh, this now infamous music festival. The actual experience exceeds all expectations. It is something that's hard to put in words. All these things that may seem big and impossible are not. It gives people that type of energy, that type of power. That looked quite nice, <laughs> <So long ago. laughs> especially uh, given what we're, we're all doing now. On a completely unrelated note, it brings up this idea of these bubble vacations, bubble resorts I'm hearing about, where everybody there is uh, COVID negative and you can just kind of enjoy yourself uh, without the, uh, the necessity for social distancing and masks. And I'm like, wow, what a brilliant idea. It never ceases to amaze me how private sector will adapt. Um, but of course, the reality of Fire Festival was far different uh, than that, that advertisement we just watched that was put forth by all these well-known social media influencers who said they themselves would be a part of the Fire Festival. A um, little bit of background, it was organized by Billy McFarland and Ja Rule. Um, of course, at the end of the day, Billy McFarland is currently in prison. He went to prison for a number of fraud-related offenses in uh, both federal and, and state court um, regarding his promotion and organization of Fire Festival. But then there's the influencers, some of whom you, you saw and you might have noticed in that video itself. Kendall Jenner, Bella Hadid, Haley Baldwin, Emily Radzikowski. Uh, these are our, our big-time personalities out in the public domain and all appeared in that video, all said they would be there, all posted this over their Instagrams, Twitters, Facebooks, and YouTubes. And one important thing to note, however, 
did not disclose, at least initially, that they had been paid to do so. And we're gonna we're gonna come back to that thought. And of course, whether we're intimately familiar with it or not, we know how the fire festival ended. Uh, these these uh, luxury accommodations turned out to be nothing more than than FEMA tents that were damp from a night's rain the night the evening before. The gourmet food was nothing more than my my colleague Neil loves pointing this out. This cheese sandwich in the uh, in the bottom corner. Uh, only one local band played. And at the end of the night, what we had was a lot of people who had paid thousands of dollars for tickets scrambling into the Grand Exuma, Grand Exuma, by the way, not owned by Pablo Escobar uh, uh, Airport, and actually getting locked in there, some passing out because of dehydration, doing anything they could to get on a flight back to the United States. So we've seen the campaign, we've seen the results. We know that the organizers are now behind bars for their culpability in the situation, but then again, it comes back to the idea of these influencers. So for anyone, uh, I encourage you, I guess, use the chat function here, right? What, if anything, did these fire starters, as they're affectionately called, these renowned influencers, perhaps do wrong, right? I think there's the obvious notion that they got paid and did not disclose it. And we'll go into what requirements the Federal Trade Commission has regarding payment and disclosure of payment. But beyond that, I, I'm interested in hearing thoughts in the chat um, if there's anything that they did wrong. Well, I also actually um, made it possible for everybody to unmute themselves. There's not that many of us on the call. So if anyone nice. speak, you can just unmute yourself. All right, thank you, Yana. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm interested. I see we got Laura and Anne and uh, Ritu. If anyone's got any thoughts on uh, what, if anything, these folks did wrong, I'd love to hear them. Uh, hi. hi. I would say they weren't being authentic. Mm -hmm. And and they they were advertising like this beautiful, luxurious experience like Coachella. And then you're saying it was just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, a lack of a lack of authenticity. Uh, but you begs the question, kind of, how authentic is influencer marketing to begin with? And is that a requirement of it? My colleague Neil might argue it works better when that's the case. But from a legal perspective, outside of perhaps disclosing you got paid, is authenticity a requirement? given the social power wielded by can uh, i ask a question <laughs> how would you define authenticity i'm uh, this is something that i'm actually very passionate about these days and i'm curious about how would you define authenticity did these people know what they were doing or were they just like filming a video did they know anything about the event that was going to happen I think they were under the impression, my, my understanding is they were under the impression that this was going to be a Coachella, to Laura's point, mm -hmm. type music festival held in, in the Bahamas and they were being paid to essentially go there and have a wonderful weekend partying and have that all filmed and then subsequently promote that on their various social media uh, to the public. And probably with the, the idea that they would attend at the end of the day too, which none of them did, by the way. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say authenticity, uh, being authentic is, you're being truthful. Okay. I mean, it, it's, it's a difficult uh, definition to, yeah. to come up with, but. So there's, there's it's actually, it's actually uh, it, something that I'm, I just read a book, a friend of mine just wrote a book about this, um, about, it's called in, uh, in, How to in, Build an Inspirational Brand. And she talks about her seven brain-friendly branding ideas. And she said, the second one is to be authentic. So I think truthful is truthfulness is an important part of the authenticity because that's certainly credibility. But, you know, there are, I won't, I'll try not to be political, but there are politicians that come across as authentic, but they're not being truthful. So is it, a, is authenticity a feeling or is it an impression? And, and, and 
And it, what's interesting too is we there's research out there that says many consumers, millennials, younger millennials, and Gen Z will only do do business with brands that they consider authentic. Uh, Yana or Anne, can you unmute uh, the participants? I don't have that ability. Uh, everybody can unmute themselves. Should be able to. Some people are having trouble though unmuting yeah. themselves. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I'm, this is actually something that I'm very curious about. And I think that, uh, you know, I talked about it earlier on and I'm just curious how, how do we, how do, how do, how does somebody like the, you know, to bring it back to our, 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 our models, our Bella Habibs and Haley Baldwins, how come they're come across as authentic when they don't really even know what this festival is going to be? I mean, they were hired to go down there, and I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm just throwing that out because I don't know the answer. I'm just curious. I, I'll, I'll read one of the responses from Rose Cardarelli because they're saying still they can't unmute themselves. Mm -hmm. She says, I think they were authentic in the fact that they had a job and did the job. Okay. If they were involved in the dishonesty, that would be different. Mm -hmm. Ah, so they weren't part of, they weren't collusive, they weren't colluding. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I actually read the whole story about this event and, uh, you know, when the influencers did their ads, you know, it was, it was a fan fabulous idea and the um, guys thought that they could pull it out, but they really didn't. You know, it was just, they, they were smoking something or whatever. They, it was such a huge endeavor and their, the vision that they had was fabulous, but you know, it was just un, un, um, impossible to do. And so when, when, when influencers did their, at least their first, these, these ads, they all thought that, okay, you know, he has all these uh, people connections he'll be able to pull this through and he was trying and trying to the very end but you know it just wasn't something that he could he could do and he had trouble he, he nothing was nothing was established before the ads were sent they didn't have the place they didn't have you know yeah. anything yet so it was it was Here's a question I have, though, to, to again, to the audience, to build off that. Do these influencers, you look at the numbers, right? Kendall Jenner, over 72 million followers. Emily Ratchikowski, 10 million followers, and so on. Do they somehow have an ethical responsibility or perhaps a legal responsibility to maybe do their own due diligence when we see, given Neil's presentation earlier, the power that they wield? Or are they just scotch free? They yeah. got paid to do a job. What the point I'm getting at is, okay, they got paid to do a job and we can talk about authenticity and honesty uh, and whose fault it was and who should be blamed. But given the stature and influence, for lack of a better term, that these individuals hold, should it be on them to some degree? Oh, yes, I think so. I think so too. Yeah. I guess it's like the wild, wild west. <laughs> yes. You know, when it's new, there aren't any like rules. Mm -hmm. to abide by until maybe the law kicks in and creates some, you know, ramifications so, so that, that they are in alignment with mm -hmm. being and honest. I, or... We have a comment here. I got the chat up now, so Neil and I can see it. <laughs> Someone, uh, Ritu says they should have, an, and apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, uh, Ritu. Uh, yes, they should have their legal teams look into seeing if what they are promoting is legit. However, here you had Ja Rule involved. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that lends some credibility to it. Right. Uh, I haven't listened to a Ja Rule song since 2001 probably, <laughs> but <laughs> in fairness, that said, it's name. Yeah, yeah, it's a name, it's a name. It's, it, it, it lends uh, some semblance of credibility. And interestingly enough, Ja Rule was able to kind of wiggle his way out of any liability uh, for, these, for these events that transpired. Um, but I want us to think about this question, is the law going far enough? And now I'm gonna actually talk about the law, right? We haven't talked about the law. I just kind of threw this out there to get people thinking about, well, should there be legal limitations on this? And if not, are there ethical limitations on this? But let's take a look at what the law 
uh, even even says about it, right? So, right. This is a landscape that is within the domain of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is the uh, government agency that's responsible for regulating uh, influencer marketing. But what's interesting is regulation is a real loose term when it comes to the FTC's approach to influencer marketing. So the entire realm, the entire realm of influencer marketing that we've discussed is governed, and I use the air quotes, governed by a set of online advertising guidelines. They are online advertising guidelines, a guideline, not even an administrative regulation, so not even technically law, just guidelines that were put out by the Federal Trade Commission when? In 2009. So here we are in 2020, and the law of the land is guidelines from 2009. Now, suffice to say, a lot has changed in the world of social media, in influencer culture, and influencer marketing over these past 11 years. Look no further than, than uh, Neil's statistics to show that. Now, the FTC, to its credit, has issued a number of supplementary guidance letters and advisory letters and advisory opinions about the matter. But the, the basic fact remains that here we are to Laura's comment about the Wild West. That's exactly what this is. We're operating on a set of guidelines. If they were 2009, they were probably drafted, God knows when, 2005, 2006, the way government agencies work before they became public, dealing not with influencers, not with social media, with online advertising generally, I'm talking like pop-up ads uh, and, and things of that nature is what this is meant is meant to encompass. So that is the scope of, 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 of regulation for this industry, wild, wild west indeed. Now, as I mentioned, there's been a number of supplements uh, in the form of advisory opinions and letters um, that have sort of given some clarification to what these online advertising guidelines from 2009 mean. And basically what we could do is without getting all technical, distill the FTC's parameters into the simple phrase, advertising should be truthful and not misleading. That is what the FTC requires. Some more social media influencer centric uh, um, requirements that, that should be adhered to, that should be met are knowing when to disclose. Obviously, hey, you're being paid, you should disclose. But payment takes on a lot of different forms. Payment could be, I, don't, I didn't get cash, but I got a freebie, right? I'm gonna advertise this, this clothing brand because they sent me, right, a free shirt and a free pair of pants. That's something that should be disclosed. But it's not just about, right, material things. It's also about the relationship. Say my brother or my best friend is starting a brand and I'm a, I'm a significant influencer that's well known, one of those uh, uh, mega influencers out there. That's something I might wanna say, by the way, this is my brother's brand. So there's two forms of, of knowing when to disclose. There's the material, of course, but then there's also the relationship side. It's not always about some form of compensation. It could be due to the nature by which the two parties know each other. Disclose first, so often, right? And this kind of leads into the get the placement right, which is behind it. So often, Fire Festival being the case, although no one disclosed with Fire Festival, a different uh, instance and example we're going to look at in a minute will we'll, we'll illustrate this point. You get this great advertisement, this great endorsement, this great photograph, and then what happens, right? They, they do disclose their, their endorsement status, right? The fact that they've been compensated or that there's some relationship, but they do it way down in the bottom where no one's going to see it. What the FTC would like to see is disclose first. Hey, if this is a picture, put it in the picture. If this is a video content, like the one we just watched, put it somewhere in the video. If it's a hashtag, right? Let's make that a hashtag, the first hashtag. It should be prominently displayed so that there's no conjecture on the part of the consumer or audience member, whether or not there's something that needs to be disclosed here, some sort of com compensatory or close-knit relationship between the parties. There's many features on social media now, right? That say in partnership with, in partnership with, but they vary from platform to platform. Their placement is in different, um, 
areas of a particular site, not necessarily where somebody who's scrolling through their phone or scrolling on their tablet or on their computer screen might see. So the FTC recommends do not use those features. Go out of your way to take an affirmative step to actually disclose the nature of the relationship. Hashtags are fine. Hashtags are fine, but hashtag thanks is not. Hashtags can be used to disclose a relationship that the public should be aware of to make it so that the advertisement is not untruthful, it is not misleading. Um, however, you can't just say hashtag thanks. And last but not least, of course, give the give the full story. And this takes on numerous forms too. Give the full story in terms of one disclosure, but two, give an honest opinion, right? Advertising should be truthful and not misleading. If you're doing a food review at a restaurant, just because they comped your meal, does, and even if you disclosed it, does not mean they deserve a good review. Your review should be authentic. It should be sincere. And in turn, we might argue that that's actually going to help the credibility of the influencer as well. So how are these enforced? We know that there's these antiquated, outdated guidelines. We know that there's a checklist of things that an influencer uh, should be doing in the year 2020. But what does the FTC actually do when someone runs amok of these guidelines, when someone runs amok of these rules? And the first instance we had of this was back in 2014. So Warner Brothers, uh, their video game division, was releasing a video game called Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, based on the very popular Lord of the Ring franchise. And what they decided to do was hire an influencer very renowned in the gaming community named PewDiePie, <laughs> PewDiePie, so you can't make this stuff up, PewDiePie, <laughs> to, to uh, essentially give positive reviews of the video game. Now, if you look at you look at this graphic I have up on the screen, the interesting part about this particular influencer advertising and marketing and this particular relationship was that there was a disclosure. But check it out, right? On your screen, on a computer, on a phone, you see that arrow, you see the picture of PewDiePie with his headphones and his microphone doing his, his live stream about how great the game is. There's that button there, show more, show more. And guess what? People don't want more, <laughs> less is more for most people when it comes to social media. So what does they do? You click show more and then this video was sponsored by Warner Brothers is what'll be revealed. However, as far as the FTC is concerned, this was no good. And they decided to actually crack the whip and come down on who? PewDiePie for his influencing or for Warner Brothers? They came down on Warner Brothers here. They came down on Warner Brothers here. Warner Brothers did nothing but pay PewDiePie to give good reviews and give and uh, also gave, they provided him advanced copies of Shadow of Mordor to promote to the public. He's the one who's responsible for his social media page, right? But instead of coming after him, the FTC goes instead after Warner Brothers here. In other words, don't hate the play, hate the game. So it's the company here that's been penalized for the actions of an influencer, which is in many ways emboldening and empowering to these influencers. And at the same time, kind of a whoa, time out for any organization looking to use influencer marketing to get their brand uh, across to the general public, all right? But here's the kicker. So I'm telling, setting up this story of how the FTC cracked down on Warner Brothers. What does cracking down mean in this scenario? Cracking down means uh, a fine, no. Some sort of advertising sanctions, no. Cracking down meant signing a piece of paper that says we won't do this again. That's all Warner Brothers had to do after all this big hoopla over the FTC so we're gonna crack down on influencers, we got it. And they don't even go after the influencer, they go after the, the, the company that hired the influencer who was completely sort of not unresponsible for what actually happened. And at the end of the day, well, you know, oh, we're sorry, we won't do it again, right? That was the, the, the net effect. And you're gonna see a pattern here, you're gonna see a trend. So a couple of years later, Fire Festival happens. And basically right after Fire Festival, the FTC, it's like, oh God, we gotta, we gotta figure this out. We gotta figure this out. We need to start policing this in some way. So what do they do? They round up a group of the 90 most popular influencers and they send them what's called an informational letter 
which reiterates a lot of that information I shared with you guys. They distilled their guidelines down to a couple of applicable bullet points, and they sent these to the influencers, said, hey, don't do it. Don't do it anymore. And eventually, for the first time ever, a little later that year, so this goes back to 2017, the FTC finally, Shadow of Mordor was 2014, uh, now we're now in 2017, finally goes after an influencer. Or did they? Or did they? Right? So the 2017 example is from uh, a company called CSGO Lotto, right? And two well-known well -known influencers, T. Martin and Syndicate, uh, were brought up on FTC charges because they were promoting, promoting this brand without disclosing um, that they were in some way compensated by the brand to do so. But notice they said, right, they go after the influencers this time, sort of, because guess what? T. Martin and Syndicate own the company. So interestingly enough, they are both influencer and brand in the same. So what we really have is a situation where you can't point to a single example of the FTC actually going after an influencer here. Always the, the organization, never the influencer. And in this case, it was kind of a, uh, an, an odd amalgamation of both. And guess what their penalty was? Let's sign a piece of paper that says we won't do this again. I see the faces laughing. What does the FTC do now? Well, they wrote those earlier that year. They did the informational letters to 90 influencers. They got a little more focused in their efforts and they sent out a official warning letter to, uh, to uh, 25, approximately 25 of the influencers on that list of 90, the biggest ones. Now it was information, now it's a warning. You guys aren't following what we told you. I don't know, maybe they'll make them sign a, I won't do this again either one of these days, right? And that leads to another, I think, a good discussion point. So now you're kind of familiar with the law. There really is not. There's a few good, good practice guidelines to do if you want, want to avoid the headache of dealing with the FTC. But we really know that bringing down the hammer, all that means is, all right, we're going we're gonna to tell you don't do this again, slap on the wrist. So my question that I pose, and whether it's um, people who are able to speak and unmute themselves or people in the chat, is does the law do enough here? And if not, should it do more? And, and at the end of the day, is this really a legal issue or, or is it an ethical issue? Is it an ethical issue that the consumer base, the public, is, is, is uniquely in position to police on its own? We see influencers getting called out all the time. So I'm interested to see uh, what, what everyone's thoughts are. Are you surprised that there's so little going on in terms of regulation? Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it is one of those self-policing industries. Um, so I'm interested in, in any comments anyone has to, uh, to get the discussion going. I think that, um, you know, social media people um, probably a more uh, influential um, slapping of the wrist or, you know, like a consequence would be some kind of a, well, shaming or, you know, something on in the opinion of maybe people people saying that that's not cool and we don't want you to just do stuff like that or you know it's, it's, i don't know i mean it's just but definitely this is homeless this um legal legal uh part is this just doesn't have any anything uh, so, any influence in my mind so yes you know the the if you think that the power of an influencer is based on the followers he or she has, then shaming them among those followers could potentially be a hindrance. However, <laughs> I go back to James Charles and I forget who it was, but he had some sort of a squabble I don't, I'd have to look it up with another influencer where he dissed this influencer who was, who had supported him. And that turned into a big shaming thing. Well, PS, J James Charles now has 23 million followers on Instagram. So, you know, is it consistent with his brand to be, you know, a little controversial maybe? Uh, 
perhaps, you know, I would suggest, and not that they would ever do it, I would suggest that the best, the worst thing you could do to these influencers is to shut down their social media account. Probably, yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. and, you know, now Facebook is having troubles, to, all kinds of, they're in the news right now about what, what they will, it's a, it's a conversation that we're having in this day and age about Twitter, Facebook, they are now, I mean, you probably, you could address this even better than I can, but a conversation that Twitter and Facebook are now out there with, you know, what kind of content should we allow on our platform? Is it appropriate without stifling freedom of speech? I guess the problem is if there's a legal, um, you know, decision, uh, you can't force someone to shut down their Instagram account or social, you know, other social media accounts or, right? No, you can't, I guess. I mean, I see Anne asked a question in the chat. How could they possibly monitor all influencer posts? And I want you to hold that thought, Anne, because we're going to go there with a case study in a few minutes. Um, but it, drew, it, 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 it creates this interesting line of thinking. Is this something where analogous to kind of private industry, right? You could think of the influence um, and capital raised by these, these multinational corporations in some cases and say the government steps in and regulates them in some way. Is this where maybe we take the classifications of influencers and the law should approach it that way? So if you're purely a pure for-profit influencer um, with an X amount of followers, these are the rules you got to play by and, and so on. Treat these influencers kind of like, in my opinion, what they actually are, which is a business in and of themselves. Um, does anyone think that it, it's right to punish the companies that hire them, or is it at reached that that point, that turning point, where now it's the influencers who wield all this power? It's the companies knocking down their doors, not the other way around. That we need to—they're the ones that need to be taken to task. And is that maybe classification status a way of of doing it? Or on the other side of that, are, are consumers? responsible enough or aware enough that they can do their own self-selecting, <laughs> mm. their own their own editing. Well, I think with all the, all the fake news that's out there nowadays, maybe we consumers also are getting a little smarter about, you know, looking but, high the rope. <laughs> but what we have seen is that there's such a, such a, uh, a influx and then you're like, we just drowning on all kinds of uh, messages that I don't know that it's it would really be fair for for the uh, uh, person who goes and, and checks out somebody's post to, to uh, know, know how to make sure that it's legit to vet that post sure but here's the thing here's the thing you know it's still paid advertising the brand is still paying the, the, the paying the influencer paying the spokesperson the only the only difference is that there's a conversation between the influencer and the consumer potentially, right? So that's what makes influencer marketing not spokes not not having a spokesperson. But if the is so the question is is the consumer um, I don't want to say smart enough, but is does the consumer have the the know it all to be able to determine? I mean, we make decisions about brands all the time. I like, I like Target, I don't like Walmart. And that's just a decision I've made. Is that the same thing with an influencer? If I'm following an influencer and he's, he or she is talking about, you know, they like Clinique, not Lancome, different, you know, it's really just a personal preference. Well, you might know, you might think that Walmart is uh, too powerful, you know, and it kind of cuts the down on, on what they, um, how they treat their their um, employees and whatnot that, that might influence your view of Walmart versus Target. I mean, so the more actual social information one gets, like the, the the better you can actually make an informed decision. So the consumer has enough can go out and find the information him or himself or herself and, think, and educate uh, themselves, right? I think the, uh, both the company and influencer uh, should be held accountable. And I don't know if you've seen the recent documentary, uh, Hacking Your Mind. No. And 
it's 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 a lot about social media and influencing the consumer and they're saying the consumer is actually quite lazy um and will just like if my friend likes target i'll buy stuff at target it's like i won't do my own research because i'm influenced by my friend and as you're saying if, if you're influenced by you know these celebrities and they buy certain brands you buy into it and but it it gets tricky when it becomes unethical like if you want to talk about politics i don't think we'll, we really want to go there but <laughs> <laughs> well, that's let's, where, let's, yeah well let's use an example what about eva longoria who let her hair go she wouldn't dye her hair while she was in quarantine and now she dyes her hair now is there is there any you know is there any ethical issues with that? It's just it's a I mean, in, in essence that's a and she's a huge influencer. She's got a big following. You know is there is there um, you know she chose one brand over uh, one brand paid her to use their brand to at to dye her hair. Are there ethical issues with that? Can we believe that? Is that the same as is that the same as Haley Baldwin going to this island and swimming in, uh, jumping off a boat and swimming in it, saying, look at how pretty it is down here. Well, that wasn't actually the island that they were able to construct here. So <laughs> it was <laughs> all side of the there already. I'll, I'll just read uh, what Rose Cardarelli said. Um, she said, well, thank you. She finds, you know, this discussion very interesting. And um, she says, decisions on brands are personal until they are public, then responsibility lies with all. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I, I would say, but when we say responsibility lies on all, is that to the point where we formalized this it's become what we call a mature industry, and now the law needs to in some way interject itself to make sure that the general public is not victimized by it. So we have to define what is responsibility. There's the argument to be made that, well, responsibility is codified in a series of laws and administrative regulations and said legislation and statutes that we use to govern a free society to the benefit of all, I, ideally, right, in theory. Mm -hmm. um, so does that, is that the point we've reached? We need to step in. This is the type of thing that regardless, without uh, getting into either side of the aisle politically, we kind of need to start having hearings on and, and considering legislation to pass because at the end of the day, who are we trying to protect? We're trying to protect us, the consumers, um, from things that we're, we're, we're certainly debatable. We're hearing both sides of the argument now, whether or not the average consumer is in a position to have the know with all and the wherewithal to determine that the distruth, untruthful and misleading from the truthful and, and authentic. I think in the US overall, the feeling is, you know, it has been for a long time, definitely that, you know, uh, the companies can, um, sell things that don't immediately kill you and mm -hmm. uh, and they can uh, make all kinds of claims and and it's you know that they they haven't been really held responsible for, for what they get to push and um, that there definitely should be a change in that but, um, and you know it's like it's also with the politics you know like Trump keeps on pushing the envelope and keeps on getting away with it. There has to be some somewhere you have to put your foot down and say, this is no good. I see another good question from Yana. I'm gonna just kind of parking lot this one as well because we're going there next in a way. Problem if the influencer is not paid uh, as is likely with a celebrity promoting a nonprofit. So both you and Anne ask questions that I think lend to the case study that we're gonna transition to in just a, a few moments. But uh, I think certainly in a lighting discussion and it's not an easy one, uh, to, uh, to, to, to draw a conclusion on. On one hand, you say, oh, the public should be able to police this. But on the other hand, well, maybe it's a little out of control and our legislative bodies and administrative agencies need to step in and kind of protect the public from itself in certain cases, but they've proven themselves sort of immobile uh, 
extremely divided and partisan and unable to do so. Uh, so it's 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 a dilemma that that we're we're wrestling with. Uh, kind of on an unrelated note, we finally see in DOJ going after Google, and yeah. uh, today, yeah. so certainly relevant, certainly timely. And you know, I like using Google, um, but I'm an attorney, and and I, I understand the legal side of it. And my question was, what the hell took you so long, DOJ? <laughs> They've had a monopoly for 20 years now, right. right? Going on 20 years now. What took you so long? Um, so we need to decide. We need to decide whether um, these things serve a, under the law, uh, a public utility in that respect when it comes to Google. Is it such a public utility that we give it a pass? And that's why they're allowed to have all this influence and power? Or, or uh, do we want to crack down the whip and, and, and change the way business is conducted? And the same could be said for these influencers, too. I just don't think we've had our day of reckoning yet. I don't think Fire Festival in isolation and these little instances that I've cited for, for, for you guys along the, uh, the way here really hammer the point home. I think it's going to take, in fact, we keep trying to avoid politics, but interestingly enough, I think the closest we're getting to a reckoning with this is with this election and the things Facebook and Twitter are doing uh, on their own, by the way, voluntarily, not, not as mandated by the government to say, look, okay, influencing takes on a lot of shapes, a lot of forms. It's not always for profit. It's not always for a brand. It, it, it works. It's effective and it can be dangerous when done improperly. So right now the, the social media companies are taking it on themselves to, to, to do the policing. It's not going very well. Uh, Neil mentioned that earlier. If anyone else has read up on it, I, I have also, it's not going very well, yeah. but all, all thoughts to consider. When, when, does, it, when does it end? It's, it's, it was all well and good um, with a TV commercial, but uh, now we've reached uh, new territory where we're talking personal, customized, intimate relationships, even with the biggest of influencers and a person. And that's extremely more powerful than a Honey Nut Cheerios commercial. <laughs> it just is, right? But um, I, want, I want to get into this. Um, I want to get into this because uh, we've heard talked about, and this sort of touches on the thought of somebody not paid, they're working for a non-for-profit. Um, how could they possibly, the FTC or the government, if it wanted to, monitor all posts? Well, the question that actually has come out is what happens when it's an anonymous influencer, right? It's very easy to point a finger at Kendall Jenner and say, hey, you, and your 72 million followers, we see you. But what about, right, when it's kind of on that smaller level, not a, necessarily a ton of followers, and the person's anonymous. They don't even, we don't even know who that person is to go after them. And let's take that a step further. Not only are they anonymous, they are what we consider Neil's sixth category of influencers. They are that advocacy influencer. So now we have someone who's not getting paid, and we don't even know who they are. We don't even know who they are, and that brings forward a case study. Some of which, uh, some of uh, which, uh, some of you may be familiar, is uh, the Diet Madison Avenue case. The Diet Madison Avenue case, and sort of the long and short of it is this: um, a couple of years ago, an anonymous Instagram account uh, pops up, and what it starts doing is outing advertising executives on Madison Avenue in the advertising industry in New York who were alleged or accused uh, of sexual harassment. And that's a key word there, accused. We're gonna see how that plays out. And it would post pictures of these individuals, tell stories about these individuals. And it was allegedly run by 17 anonymous men and women with close ties or uh, who are currently in the industry. Right? They would claim every charge is fully vetted by multiple, multiple sources. They're working with uh, you know, brilliant minds to lend some credibility. Uh, of course, a little bit of a snarky tone with some graphic language, specifically when illustrating the examples of the accused. Um, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, one of the gentlemen, one of the gentlemen, the gentleman right here on the right, name being Ralph Watson, took issue with it. Right? Um, I'm going to go back to it. What does he do? He says this is all, it cost him, by the way, uh, to go into Ralph Watson for a second. So he was one of the targets of this anonymous advocacy social media account, kind of sprung up in the, uh, in the wake of Me Too. And he got singled out. Um, and people started coming forward, or anonymous sources started coming forward through this account to accuse him of sexual harassment. And 
um, at the end of the day, he ended up losing his job. Um, he, unlike the others pictured with him, and there were several others in addition to them, uh, did what? He said, this is absolutely bogus. I am suing. I'm going to take this to court, and I'm going to sue to clear my good name. I'm going to bring a defamation suit against the anonymous Diet Madison Avenue Instagram account and the mysterious people, the 17 anonymous men and women behind it. Now, that begs the question, right? What do you guys think? We know what it's like to give Kendall Jenner a slap on the wrist and we can talk about what the form that what form that should take, whether there should be laws about it, whether it's ethical for her or any any mega influencer for that matter to engage in a certain line of conduct. But what do you guys think? Is there any way is there any way to police this? We don't know who the influencer is. Maybe they don't rise to the level of a mega influencer where there's millions of followers and they're easy to crack down upon in some way, shape, or form publicly. And not only that, they seem sort of credible in what they're saying. It's believable. But then on the other hand, you have an individual here who's in Ralph Watson claiming this was a complete fabrication. It was all made up. And we're going to see how the story played out. But before we get to the conclusion or lack thereof, I'll, I'll, I'll foreshadow a little bit of the Ralph Watson story suing Diet Madison Avenue, what happens in this case? Is there any way to police this legally, ethically? Or is this just a situation where we have to throw our hands up in the air and say, it's out of our control? It's beyond our control. Thoughts? I see people making wow faces, like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the difference between this and a whistleblower who actually is right? Hmm. The, di the difference between this is we're going to assume for the purposes of this case study, and it has not been proven either way yet, that the accusations are false. The accusations are false. But, you know, it's funny, Neil and I have worked on this project for, for about two years now. Um, we've published a paper, of course, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll um, you know, I'll, I'll point you guys in the direction of where you can find that at the end of our discussion today. Um, but this could take on many forms. Say it's an anonymous influencer, not who's getting people fired, but is spreading some kind of misinformation that causes other people to go out and hurt other people. How do we bring that, that influencer, that anonymous advocacy influencer spreading misinformation, spreading hate in this instance, how do we bring that person to justice? Is there any way to police this? So um, you can just use the hypothetical that it's a mystery. We're not sure yet, and we're going to see that in a moment, about the uh, uh, Watson v. Diet Madison Avenue case. It hasn't come to light yet, whether it was a mistruth or not, but um, there's a number of hypothetical scenarios, one worse than the next, that you could play out in your mind and saying, how far does this rabbit hole go? It almost sounds like he, he is committing some kind of uh, misdemeanor, like he could be brought to court and maybe the detectives follow him. I, I don't know. If he's not like a Ralph Nader who's really trying to protect the consumer, as you're saying. Right. Yeah, I mean, is this something we're going to leave to the criminal law? But then again, it, th this case is a civil case. It cost this guy his job. He didn't end up, it, you know, he wasn't, or, or maybe that should be criminalized. Maybe instead of suing Diet Madison Avenue, he should be looking to press charges and the law should have some form of cybercrime in place to deal specifically with this. You know what, even as a legal mind myself, I, I, I don't really know. Them. I'm at a loss. So I'm always interested to hear what people who aren't coming at this from the perspective of a attorney. These are the laws. These are how mm -hmm. laws get passed. These are how laws are enforced. I'm interested to see your thoughts. Is it, is it a criminal act? What's going on here? Even with um, Diet Madison Avenue, to the extent it's untruthful, it cost this guy greatly, cost Ralph Watson greatly. Um, is that something we should be sending people to jail for? that there should be legal protections for? Yeah, it's a good question. Because it's ruining his reputation too, professionally. Yeah, he lost his job. He mm. was a multi-million dollar ad executive at a well-known firm. There should be some kind of uh, compensation paid to him and uh, 
and some sort of public apology or, you know, on the same media. <laughs> And it's sort of like a white collar crime. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Well, yeah. it's a modern day crime, and and they they do seem to find people, you know, like the the um, all these Russian bots and whatever. They they are able to somehow follow the follow the trails and 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 get somewhere. So I think they should be able to be found out and uh, and you know this because this is a modern day thing that this should definitely become some some kind of a consequence of a legal legal issue I but think. here's here's the first question i have and you can answer this maybe how do we know whether he did it or not i mean he could he could be very well guilty of it or he couldn't be very well guilty all we know is that because of this he lost his job so it needs to be examined, you know. Somehow, it ha you know, you have to go get to the, do some research, the um, investigations and all that. Yeah, that's where you get the detective <laughs> involved. <laughs> While we have the discussion going, I want to, set, so I want to, I want to actually, because this might shift the discussion, I want to actually share what has happened with Ralph Watson's case, right? So the law, real quickly, it protects people using a pseudonym. Um, for speech under the First Amendment. So this is basically just a long, boring quote from the Supreme Court saying, yes, you can speak uh, under the guise of a pseudonym. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, basically the only recourse then is to bring a defamation suit, Ralph Watson did. Now, let's see where that suit ended up, right? Ralph Watson is currently fighting. These cases were filed in 2018 and early, early, like January, 2019. And he is fighting in court just to find out who the people behind this account were. He's going, he's, he's uh, motioning the court and arguing for the court to issue what are called DOE subpoenas, meaning we don't know who the people are. But when you issue a DOE, a John or Jane DOE subpoena, that's basically saying, look, it's going to go to Instagram and they're going to have to come to light, whoever the people were, were at least at least registered this account at the very least. And thus far in New York and California, right, he has been unable, he's got two lawsuits going, unable to even find out who these people were by bringing a defamation suit. Now, let me tell you something about bringing a defamation suit too. This is not a cheap endeavor. He's now two years into litigation in one, in one instance and oh, well, almost that two in another. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that he's spending on attorneys, on court appearances, on motion practice, just to find out the names of these people. And that's how the system's set up now. And he's unable to. Do we think that is right? I mean, it is the law, but should it be? And if not, what are the ethics behind it? Because it's easy to say, oh, the myth, the truth, the mistruth, we need to have an investigation. But this guy went to court and he can't even, they won't even let him find out who these people are. And he swears he is completely innocent. Has anyone come forward, come forward to corroborate any of these accusations against no. the others? Mm -mm. So it seems like it should should just be shut down and thrown out and yeah. Should well, is that fair to him? No one's come out to corroborate what Diet Mad Madison Avenue said about it, if I understood you correct. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. So basically these anonymous advocacy Instagram posts, allegedly advocacy, we don't know the truth, we might never find it out, ruined this guy, ruined his entire career. And he's now spending thousands of dollars and now years of time in the courts just trying to find out who's responsible on the other end and has thus far been unsuccessful. So and none of the people who were supposedly had been um, abused by him have stepped up and said, no, that's not true. That's a lie. That's correct. There's been nobody that's come out independent of the Instagram post and said, no, it was me. Here I am. And uh, he sexually harassed me. Or the other way. No, or the other he hasn't way. done. No one's come out to vindicate him either. So in this case, is this something that, you know, like the public, what do you call it, prosecutor could take up? 
as a crime. I mean, people hurt other people in other ways. Um, it would have to fit the elements of a crime. And, and basically the way the law is now, it doesn't. Unfortunately, it's defamation, right? Defamation is not a crime. So I can make up a mistruth about each of you. I can say it on this, 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 um, this program and whoever watches this program, right? They could take that and I can state it as a fact, not an opinion. And then you guys would have a claim for defamation against me. But defamation is about money. Yeah. So there's not even a criminal mechanism for this. Mm -hmm. Making a mistruth is simply, right? Uh, the thing that would make it a crime would be say there was money involved. Right. Oh, I mean, he lost his job. That's a lot of money. Yeah, but it wasn't the typical. It didn't meet the the elements of a larceny or of a trick by fraud, for example. Right. I think larceny by it. trick or any of those. <laughs> we need he lost, more. He lost potential money. Who's to say he wouldn't have gotten fired the next day for getting drunk on the job? Hypothetically, mm -hmm. potential money, but that's not the same as hey, I'm going to take what's yours and make it mine. Also, it wasn't to the, to the, it's not like the, the person on the other side for a crime, the person on the other side has to gain from that as well for it to be a crime. In the we true don't sense. know if they gain something because we don't know who they got. Maybe we don't know. Maybe someone on the inside wanted his, his Maybe job. they got a promotion. <laughs> you don't know any, you don't know anything. You just know that he can't find out who run, is running this account. Well, it certainly doesn't seem fair, and uh, and 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 it just talks about, you know, it just this living in in a deluge of lies. It's just this is the new normal we are juggling with, and we desperately need new guidelines, new line laws, and new guidelines. You know, call, call me a little nuts, but uh, Neil said the way to punish these people is take away their accounts. I don't think that works here, um, but what does work with the well-known celebrity influencers. I think sometimes, I hate to say it, I think social media could be a vehicle for a lot of good, but my honest opinion in examining it, particularly over the past year especially, is that it does more harm than good. <laughs> we might be better off without it. That's my personal opinion. I think the negatives sort of outweigh the positives. I have no empirical evidence for that other than my own life experience and observations, but the things I see just frighten me. Really good, we keep talking about different documentaries, different movies. On Netflix, one called The Social Dilemma, um, which I would strongly, strongly encourage uh, um, everyone to sit down and watch if you, uh, if you haven't already. That really breaks down a lot of the addictive nature of it, a lot of the misinformation and the per per perpetuity of its spread on there. Uh, really, really fascinating stuff. And I think at the end of the day, we could talk on and on and debate on and on. I don't think there are any answers, uh, uh, easy ones. It's something that requires, I think, a lot more thought than the average member of the general public will ever give it, at least in this day and age. Anything to add? No? All right. No. Good. So just to kind of wrap up, right? Uh, Federal Trade Commission supposed to protect us. It's got those old guidelines. They don't do much. And to the extent that they do, it's a slap on the wrist, the penalty, right? Recognized influencers are one thing, but you get into smaller influencers, those nano influencers, um, and then the uh, anonymous influencers, advocacy influencers who aren't even being paid. Well, in a way, an advocacy influencer, it's without, the FTC has no control over that. Federal Trade Commission, trade is the key word. If you're an advocacy influencer, there's no recourse uh, currently under the law except to take to the courts like uh, Ralph Watson did, but we know that's gonna cost a lot of money. It's gonna cost a lot of time and there's gonna be no guarantee of success uh, in, in the end. So um, uh, we're about half an hour early. Um, but I think <laughs> we've exhausted our knowledge for right. the night, but we're happy to take questions sure. unless you've got something to add, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we should wrap it up there. And um, even though we weren't that many on the call here, we always, we, what we've noticed is we always have people signing up so that they can get the recording later. Um, even some in, in different time zones. So thank you so much, Neil and Will. Um, and uh, 
You thank you all for particip all the participants and thank you to Anne for doing the background work and Laura and our interns uh, who are fast asleep in Finland actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jana, feel free to share our contact information if anybody wants to follow Great. up with us. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. thank you so much. Thank you so great. much.